for the past two years since I joined the industry, I would say that the industry today, compared to two years ago, has changed and transformed. And this is only the start of what we call an S-curve transition of the industry. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners, and welcome to the 173rd episode of the Shipping Podcast. If you are here for the first time and want to ensure that you do not miss out on anything, please follow the Shipping Podcast on your podcast platform of choice where you usually listen to podcasts and become part of the tribe that gets to listen to new episodes as soon as they are released. And there are 172 episodes prior to this one already released. I have deep dived into the port sector. There is so much happening in the maritime industry right now. And I wanted to expand the topics of this podcast also to port-related things. In the last episode, you could listen to Patrick Verhoeven from the International Association of Ports and Harbors and hear what's on their agenda right now. In this episode, you will hear from the port of Singapore, which is among the top biggest ports in the world. On average, the port of Singapore attracts more than 130,000 vessel calls annually. The Port of Singapore is operated by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, MPA for short. And you will be listening to my conversation with the Chief Officer of MPA, Ms. Lee Hoon Kwa. Here we go. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Alina, for inviting me to this podcast. I'm Lei Hoon, Chief Executive of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. I've got 20 years of professional life, ranging from the public service, media, and now in maritime and shipping. So what is your education? What is your background? Interestingly, different from other Singaporeans, I did my studies five years in France for my undergraduate. I did University of Pantheon Sorbonne for an honours degree there in economics. Um, I had my honours there. Then subsequently, I came back, um, continued working for the Singapore government before heading to Switzerland to do my MBA in Lausanne, IMD International. So I would say pretty much my life is quite francophone, I must say. <laughs> so how did you end up in the shipping industry? What, what brought you here? Well, it's, uh, it's by chance. Um, in, within the public service, I was uh, doing different areas of work, including trade, public service, uh, social policies, population, talent development. Then I went to Channel News Asia, which is a media broadcasting company, news company in Singapore. I did a five-year stint there with media. And it came upon uh, the chance that the chief executive of uh, MPA, you know, they're looking at a successor to take over. And I expressed my interest. And I must say that since joining MPA, the amount of facts that I have found out about the media, in, uh, about the maritime industry, and the importance of port and maritime, not just to Singapore history in terms of the development of our economy, but as well as globally to the global supply chain, it has been very fulfilling for me. And I would say it's a very, very meaningful area of work. And never look back, never look back. It's been how long? About since 2018 year end. So this is my third year in the job. Uh, when we last met, I actually just joined the sector. It feels like I've been here for years already. And um, I must say, happy to be in this sector. I agree. Yeah, we met at the World Maritime Day parallel event uh, in 2019 in, uh, in Colombia, Cartagena, Colombia. We had a really good time there. So we were discussing empowering women in the maritime industry uh, as a theme from IMO. So I think you had some interesting insights there. Uh, how can we empower women in the maritime industry? 
Actually, where I am in Singapore, we can differentiate between onshore work and offshore work. Uh, when it comes to onshore, actually, um, there are uh, quite a number of females working in this industry. Of course, when I first joined the sector, people asked me, hey, it's such a male-dominated industry. Are you sure you are able to communicate with the industry leaders on this? But since I joined uh, MPA, you know, I came in as the first female chief executive. Then actually, the Singapore Shipping Association president, was a female, is a female, came after me. And then our union leader, maritime union leader, Mary Liu, he's uh, the general secretary of uh, SMOU, Singapore Maritime Officers Union, also a female. So I would say that actually in Singapore, the tripartite uh, partnership and leaders here are all females. So I would say it's female dominated in Singapore. If I look at my MPA team as well, uh, much of the senior management, more than half are actually females as well. However, having said that, I would say that um, there's a lot of talk and discussion, including the panel discussion that we were on uh, in Colombia. Perhaps looking at offshore work uh, up uh, on the sailing on the ship, that perhaps in terms of the percentage of females joining the sector as crew is relatively small compared to the male. Um, question is, how do we encourage more females to join ships? And I think um, there are two approaches which uh, Singapore is adopting. First is really looking at how do we promote that career progression, looking at both offshore and onshore. In fact, after you have worked a few years on board the ship, the experience is so valuable that maybe when you are, you know, it's time for you to settle down, you want to spend time with your family members in Singapore or onshore, that you have actually a very exciting career onshore for you. And secondly, I would say, is about also identifying exciting opportunities onshore. Shipping is in a major transformation and transition period. We're talking about uh, in this, an industry that is global, an industry that is green, going green, even more green, an industry that is also going digital and automated. So in a way, there is no reason why females cannot join the sector. Even in the port sector that, uh, you know, Singapore, we have a relatively uh, established port, uh, as a transshipment hub, even in the port sector, increasingly we are talking about automation, um, going green, and even our crane operations has become more and more automated. And there's no reason why females should shun uh, such jobs. So I would say all in all is a sector, exciting opportunities. Uh, I think the bigger question we have here in Singapore is not about attracting females into the sector, but generally attracting you know, talent into the sector. Reaching out to the young, uh, reaching out to our also experienced people. How do you come to a sector and help in the transformation and transition of this sector towards bigger good? You are putting my questions to yourself now. <laughs> I agree. How do we attract the young people? Because I think that we, we do not show them the career that is possible. We are just showing them either you could just start on the ship and maybe leave 35 years later, which is, which is not true. Or you can come into the port and, and you do the same thing for 35 years. It's not the same. It's, it's not the reality. So how do we show them that there is an exciting career in this industry? You know, Lina, actually for the past two years since I joined the industry, I would say that the industry today compared to two years ago has changed and transform. And this is only the start of what we call an S-curve transition of the industry. Um, let me explain. When I first joined, there is, I, we frame in within MPA, we're working very hard on this 3D framework, disruption, digitalization, and decarbonization. Disruption, then we were thinking of the transition you know, to IMO 2020. Little did we know that actually, if you look at today, the pandemic, COVID situation, how we are moving towards more remote operations, contactless operations, digitalization, it has moved a long way. And it is not just the regulator, it is the industry as well, industry players, international organizations, all moving towards this direction. So that's one. And if you look at digitalization, as I earlier mentioned, there are actually a very strong pursuit towards paperless, towards uh, integration, of not just within the shipping sector, but also in the global supply chain, logistics sector, because shipping after all is a means, right? We transport more than 80% of the goods, but we are one medium along the whole global supply chain. And during this pandemic, we know how important that a global supply chain and logistics sector is. And we transport more than 80% of the goods. Third, decarbonization. 
Now, how do we look at decarbonization and going green? I don't believe, you know, that green is something which our young people are not interested in. In fact, they are very interested in. So what better sector, you know, to come in at this time? Huge transformation taking place, huge digitalization going, uh, taking place as well. And we are going green. I would say global green digital is a sector that uh, is worth. But perhaps what we can do is to perhaps uh, better market ourselves, brand ourselves. It's such an important sector, but you know, we always tell our, we always say that we are the backbone of the trade. But during this pandemic, we've seen it is not the backbone of the trade. It is the important and the one and only who is able to sustain global supply chain and trade. Therefore, I would say that um, the meaning of it, the agenda of the sector are good enough to attract young people into this sector. I could see on your website that you have a few initiatives going on when it comes to making a pool of manpower and talent. So how does that work? Um, in Singapore, we are working on a range. So I think first is really we've gone uh, on a, a series of uh, campaigning to actually talk about making maritime your port of call. And I mentioned earlier, the key is actually first relate to the meaning of the sector itself. Second, we are looking at profiling more the changes that the sector is moving towards. In fact, if we want the sector to nudge the sector towards the next milestone and the next lap, you do need different talent from different sectors, different experience. Because in a way, we also learn from other sectors. If you look at aviation, land, maritime, these are the different areas where we can learn from one another. And then on top of that, if you're talking about a resilient global supply chain, it's again not just shipping. So we are broadening the context of what shipping is broadening the meaning of what shipping is. On top of that, I think there are various schemes that we have put in place. First is really putting in place scholarship program to provide that certainty, as I mentioned earlier, the career progression for seafarers, uh, Singaporeans who want to join on board the ship. What is the career you have subsequently giving you the certainty? Secondly, for onshore work, we are looking at uh, working with the Singapore Shipping Association and our unions in profiling, especially during this period as well, while other sectors are retrenching, actually in maritime, we need even more of you. And these are the areas that we are looking to attract you in. So we offer internship programs. Uh, we actually work with the companies to offer as well internship, which can even uh, provide in future uh, overseas stint to attract our young people into the job. So uh, within Singapore, quite a range of the programs. Of course, we also have the Singapore Maritime Foundation, one of our affiliates, who actually actively reach out to the university graduates, polytechnic graduates as well, conveying a little bit what the sector is about. I must say that for many, this sector is still quite a mystery because it's not so much accessible. It's unlike aviation, you know, plane. While people know about cruise ship, but cargo ships, you know, tankers, container ships, is still relatively, I would say, behind the scene for many of the public. And we need to bring that. Another area which, well, we have not really put it into plan yet, but there's been quite a lot of talk in this, is really how do we work with the shippers? How do we work with the product companies themselves in terms of profiling how the product came into place? right? How did a pen, how did your food arrive at your table? And that also requires some sort of planning in terms of, for example, if you go towards more green value chain and therefore it allows you perhaps pay a little bit more, but you get the food on your table and it is green and it is sustainable. So these are some of the other ideas that we are also thinking of in terms of profiling the maritime sector. Yeah, but you're also doing a great work when it comes to digitalization, which I think maybe also is interesting for young people, especially if they grew up with, with using digital tools to everything else. So why shouldn't they be doing that at work as well? So I saw you had something called Digital Oceans. So what is that then? Yeah, so Lina, um, really exciting to talk about digitalization because it is indeed a key priority if we look at the global supply chain or logistics sector, uh, I was told there's at least 18 touch points, meaning that digitalization can only go as far as every touch point going digital. So it is a massive and huge effort and someone has to start somewhere. And indeed, both in Singapore as well as the companies, we are all moving together on that. I think there are a few areas. First is really port. How do we digitalize port operations and digital ocean, digital port comes in. We provide a one-stop clearance. In the past, we need to submit to three different authorities. Now, just one website where the fields can be auto-populated if you already have an account with us and you can clear it, get port clearance as soon as you can. 
Digital Ocean is an expansion of the concept of digital port. Digital Ocean, we, what we aim is to put in place interoperability between the different players, between port authorities, between the port authorities, as well as the shippers, cargo owners, and see how we can work together to have data harmonization of uh, data that needs to be submitted to authorities, as well as interoperability of the different platform and system. So in a way, it makes uh, the transport of goods from one port to another, transship through another port, much more seamless. Embedded in the concept of digital ocean is also just-in-time services. So in Singapore, we provide an array of uh, marine services, for example, bunkering, crew change, as well as ship supplies. And um, the key to make the shipping more efficient is to ensure that before the ship arrives, you know that these marine services are lined up for you. And therefore, this just-in-time service is actually important. It also allows the companies and the captain, for example, to know the speed that you need to go for your ship. And therefore, again, it's also efficient, productive, as well as green and sustainable. So digitalization is uh, this aspect on the port. Um, if you will allow me, I just want to explain a little bit on digitalization on the company's perspective. Because in a way, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about the big companies who are able to put in place digitalization, but also on, on the small and medium enterprise. And actually in Singapore's ecosystem, I just had a conversation this morning with my team about small and medium enterprises. How do we bring them together? Because it is an important component of the entire maritime ecosystem. And that we actually have developed uh, last year in June 2020 with the Singapore Shipping Association and Infocom Media Development Authority authority on this playbook called the Maritime Digitalization Playbook. It serves as a reference on the type of digital transformation that you can have as a company to improve your competitiveness and productivity. And I must say that currently there are few companies that have been using this playbook and tapping on various government grants to put in place uh, our industry digital plan to adopt pre-approved solutions. And that actually gives them the knowledge, the reference point, the incentive to put in place digitalized solution. Therefore, plug themselves in the entire logistics and global supply chain. So we've been actively engaging uh, SMEs and MNCs on that. On top of that, with the companies, we are also looking at e-bills of lading, e-bunkering documents, as far as we go, as much electronic document as possible. I was just having a conversation with one industry player this morning as well. And I was asking, you know, what's the one wish you see when it comes to digital in the industry? And he actually said, paperless, paperless in 10 years time. And I think we can achieve that. Yeah, I think so too. But I think you are in the forefront of doing this. And of course, the size of, of the port you're working in is, of course, of, of importance how have your initiatives been received by the industry, by the ship owners or by the shipping companies? Are they like, yeah, we are waiting for this or are they like a bit reluctant? <laughs> You know, Lina, actually there is a lot of parallel efforts going on at the same time. So even the industry players themselves, they are actually having consortiums to try to push forward as much as possible the digitalization of, of document. There are two aspects we need to work on. First is really digitalize the whole value chain. Therefore, you need as many companies to go on board. Container shipping, for example, there's an initiative going on in terms of having a platform in terms of declaration of the cargo. And then from the port authority, uh, what we are doing is also looking at data harmonization uh, of the various ports. And this requires working uh, with industry player and with the international maritime organization. So there are a few areas that uh, we are working on, and I would say it's actually quite well received. Yeah, I can see that you have received a lot of awards as well. So <laughs> looks like people are very interested. What does this new reality look like for the maritime industry that we're, I mean, I get so excited when you talk about the green industry and the digitalization, decarbonization and all of that. And also the, the young people coming into our industry. What does it look like, this new reality that we are now sort of returning to or, or in a few years time after this terrible time we have been through now? When it comes to digitalization, and automation, I think the pace is there. It's like an S-curve. I think you just need uh, more to come on board. Data harmonization, a lot more interoperability so that the whole platform is more inclusive and therefore it's easy for people to come on board. The initial stage is always 
difficult because in a way it is about changing the way you work, changing the way of um, the way you perceive things. And there's some, you know, system, procedure, process, SOP that you need to change within the company. But I think by making it friendly, easier, data harmonized, as well as having platforms, ready platforms for companies to come on board, uh, it will be uh, much easier. And on top of that, I think if you talk about whether it's young or even, you know, um, us who are in, in our generation, we are talking about what? We are talking about we are 4G moving to 5G. We're talking about IoT. We're talking about data analytics. We're talking about AI. I, I, I foresee that at some point, it will go exponential. You know, it's like uh, handphones, right? When it first started out, we're just using what we call, um, you know, walkie-talkies, pager, you only get messages. And in the past 10 years, it's boom for, for the handphone industry. Look at uh, electronic cars. Same thing, you know, when it first started out, you need to get sort out your infrastructure incentive scheme, how you pay tax, etc. But once it's taken off, it's boom. And I think at some point for shipping, I, I can't speculate how many years it will take. At some point, I think it will go exponential. And that is such a normal thing. We'll be looking back at this interview like, hey, how strange, you know, like 10, 20 years ago, we we're talking about this. The one that is a bit more uncertain, I would say, is the direction is clear. We are going more green. But what is the solution for green? That is a bit more uncertain. Of course, we have the IMO target, 2030, 2050 to achieve. The question is, what is the solution to move there? So this is something which I think uh, is exciting in the sense that there is no concrete solution, uh, but yet there's a lot of interest, port authorities, shipping companies, owners, shipyards as well and I think we are all trying to come together to try to see whether we can find that commercially viable solution over the next five years ten years it takes uh, a ship takes how many four five years to build and it lasts for 20 years so if we want to achieve the target of 2050 it's probably about now that we have to start really finding uh, the real solution so that I think for me is a bit more question mark the direction is clear we are all moving towards that but in a way, we are all still brewing the solution together. Yeah, and if we if we talk about this year's uh, theme for IMO, it's the future of the seafarers. That is also a very important question, I think, for us to to be clear on, because that is the message we will be sending to the young generation. Are you working on that theme this year as well, as you did with the empowering women in the maritime industry? Yes, I think during this period, really during the pandemic, the plight of the seafarers has been, you know, um, highlighted, and um, they are our essential workers who are doing uh, and transporting goods, cargoes from one port to another. So at the onset of the pandemic, I think for Singapore uh, as a as a port uh, transshipment hub, we were really looking focusing at two key areas. One is uh, our port workers. How do we better equip our port workers? So I'm um, glad to say that we are one of the first countries to start vaccinating our port and maritime workers. And the vaccination is important in terms of providing uh, layers, additional layers of protection. So February, March, we have our first vaccination already. In fact, we are now starting to think that this is now about September, six months down the road. Perhaps we need to start looking at booster vaccination for uh, our port workers. On the seafarers part, uh, we focus quite a lot of efforts in terms of crew change. Crew change for two reasons. Um, first is really putting in place a safe crew change protocol. And it's not just from the port authority. It really is also from the Singapore Shipping Association, the association themselves, as well as the unions. What would it take to ensure safe crew change procedure so that we minimize the interaction between the local community? Because it can happen both ways, right? Local community and our seafarers. And we bubble wrap them from plane to vessel and sign off from vessel to plane. Then we also thought about working on how we can go upstream into the seafaring countries to help the seafarers before they come to Singapore to transit that they have already done a 14 days SHN, what we call stay at home, uh, done the relevant tests so that by the time they reach Singapore, it's very certain or it's actually as best as we can minimize the risk of um, the crew being uh, infected with COVID-19. And along the way, uh, we have to, uh, of course, tweak the procedures because in a way, uh, we have also seen whether it's uh, the different types of variants around, including the most recent, which is Delta variant, and we hear of new variants coming out. It gets more contagious, and depending on the nature of the virus, whether you need longer, shorter, stay-at-home notice, more tests before you come to Singapore. So these are quite a lot of operation work um, that we pay attention on. 
The third area, so first is uh, port and maritime workers. Second is on our seafarers, uh, vaccination of port workers, as well as looking at crew change. Of course, the other component that we were uh, looking at now is we just launched the CVAX, our seafarers vaccination, where eligible seafarers will we'll give them a vaccination first. And because being a, a huge major port, we have to prioritize in terms of uh, the categories of seafarers. So we started with foreign seafarers who's working in our port workers, for example, the bunker tankers, we have vaccinated them, more than 80% of them are already fully vaccinated. Next, we are looking at those who are on long-term stay in Singapore, uh, for example, in our shipyards, on our cruise ship, uh, who's serving the local community, as well as the yacht. We are also looking at those who are coming to Singapore on a very regular basis, for example, uh, you know, shipping uh, fish, for example, and essential supplies in Singapore. So this is the second group. The industry is working on sign-on crew. So I hope to give you good news soon uh, in this area. So that's the second part. And uh, I think the third key area really we are looking at is operations in our port. And uh, we're not the only port because we are looking, only port looking into this, contactless operations. How do we have more tele, for example, uh, consultations, uh, remote operations, so that in a way we safeguard both the port workers and the crew themselves in terms of minimize the operation. And that's important because on board the vessels, you only have how many? 20 crew and they are all essential crew operating one big gigantic uh, ship and vessel. And it's important that all of them stay safe. So these are the various areas that we are working on in terms of safeguarding uh, our seafarers as well as our port and marine workers. So I probably have the best person to, to answer my question, which is my soapbox. How can the maritime industry become more visible to the general public? That is my, you know, I think I'm like a Don Quixote on this one. <laughs> I want more people to know about us. How can we do that? Yeah, you know, a, a very simple answer is we need more Top Gun equivalent of maritime movies and not Titanic. Um, and we also need a lot more actors, you know, uh, and uh, female actresses being captains of the ship. Okay, so that's one. Lighthearted. On the more serious note, I think, the as I mentioned, the meaning of the sector itself um, is actually very important. The meaning, the importance. And I would say that actually during this pandemic, uh, while other sectors sort of suffered because of the drop in demand, because they are dealing with B2C and our sector is B2B, business to business, the resilience of it, the fact that we've seen a disruption to supply chain and we've seen you know, goods escalating price, it has put a lot of attention actually on the shipping and maritime sector. So the importance of it, I think, is not trivialized, especially during this pandemic. The question, therefore, is how do we make um, the operations of it, which actually is quite complex by nature, even after three years, I would say, I you know, get a full appreciation of the sector. For anyone, I talked to someone who was there for five, ten years, you know, they were like, I'm still learning new things. How do you, how do we simplify it? And I think when we go on a digital track, uh, when we go on an automated track, and you start using data analytics and IoT and have more interoperability, that would make the sector much more accessible. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that um, in the next few years, as we ramp up digitalization automation efforts, it will make the sector much more accessible. Then, of course, lastly, is uh, really looking at the green agenda. Actually, we do need a lot of environmental engineers coming into the sector. Uh, we also need, say, for example, uh, lecturers, you know, syllabuses that uh, reach out to the, our students in terms of what's the future of shipping like. And we're going to carve out really, you know, some niche sector in terms of what we need as in terms of talent for the sector moving forward. And I have not even mentioned, you know, the larger picture that shipping is a means of transport. And perhaps that's what we used to see it. But we, with the pandemic and the disruption in global supply chain, we actually see now a lot of interest in terms of integration, right, uh, in the supply chain, whether it's about warehousing, whether it's about air, sea, transport, a bit more integrated, air, sea, land together, um, so that you have a more diverse option. So I, I would say that it has the, the expansion of the sector looking into different aspects and perspectives to have a more resilient global supply chain has made the sector now much more accessible. It will improve over the next uh, few years. Uh, so I don't think we can... Mm, be too impatient about it is after all uh, one of the sector which is has the most ancient history in Singapore I would say you know our port is our reason that so uh, it will come the time will come it's me who is impatient I want it done already yesterday because I love the industry and, and I got the bug that everyone gets when they work in the maritime industry 
Well, Lina, what is it that you love about the industry? I will use that and translate that and excite my people in Singapore. <laughs> I think it's a, it's an international industry. It's an international industry. You you never meet a dull person. Everyone you meet has a story to tell. Everyone is interesting, and and it's a, it's a contributing to the international trade and thereby to the society in general. That is the short version of what I think about this. You're welcome to use it if you want. No problem. But actually, you are right, you know, in terms of uh, the cultural diversity, in terms of the opportunity, because it's a real global business um, in any companies, whether it's in Singapore, based in Singapore, or the opportunity to be posted overseas, it's actually a very global business. It caters to the adventurers, it caters to those who wants to make a difference in life, and as well as contribute to a very important and critical mission. So, yeah, I, I fully agree with what you said. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me today. Who do you think I should interview the next? Who would you be interested in listening to in the shipping podcast? In the shipping podcast, I would say because it's such a major shift that we are going through, I would say maybe interesting to listen to a huge logistic player, the ship uh, in terms of the cargo owners themselves, Amazon as well, for example, could be interesting to hear their perspective on how they see shipping and how shipping should be transformed. Then, of course, your ship owners, you must go to them, your ship owners, because they are the ones that's also planning, investing, making all the game plan now on how to position their ships for green, how to position um, the sector uh, for the global supply chain. In Singapore, uh, it would be interesting to hear from Chong Ming, who is uh, the CEO of PSA, uh, our port operator here. Uh, because in a way, he has the breadth of looking at digital solutions as well as a macro perspective. Uh, and he's leading a lot of industry effort, for example, in our Emerging Stronger Task Force in building the public-private partnership. So, yeah, hope that gives you enough uh, personality to interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, best luck. I hope to see you again very soon in real life. Thank you, Lehun. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Sometimes I think we all need to listen to the inspiring forerunners to feel encouraged to take that first step toward change. I love that you're talking about a campaign named Making Maritime the Port of Call. I think we could all use that as a tagline. If you have any feedback on this episode or want to know how you can support this endeavor, please drop me a line at hello at shippingpodcast.com. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 